How's it going? Christian Faith Center. Mill Creek, you are looking good today. And uh, Feds Away, hope you're doing great down there. Uh, the rain seems to have stopped this morning. It took an arc for me to get up here from Tacoma, and, uh, but I made it. And it is a beautiful June day in the Northwest. And um, hey, how good was that testimony from Marv? I loved that, that growth track testimony from Marv, one of our growth track uh, leaders and communicators and my hair guy as well. Come on, somebody. He loves a good hair stylist. And um, if you've never been to growth track, man, we want to invite you. We'd love for you to check that out. It's kind of a way to become part of the a church family in the membership, know who we are, get the heart, the vision, the heartbeat of us, and also help you discover uh, what Mar said so greatly. What, you know, God's got so much for you and figure out your spiritual giftings and your talents. And also, fun thing is we just re redid it all. So brand new content videos and same heart, same vision, same mission statement, but we repackaged it, refilmed it, reshot everything. And so it's a really fun stuff. If you've never gone through it, check it out. We do it every week during the second and the third service. So if you've never gone through it, you got to check it out at either of our campuses. And uh, hey, today we're starting a brand new series, and we're going to be on here on it for a few weeks. And the whole series is, is titled, Why? We've got seven different questions we want to answer. Uh, why questions? Have you ever asked a question, why does God not answer my prayers? Why does good things happen? I mean, why does bad things happen to good people? Why does God let bad things happen? Today we're going to talk about the idea, uh, why do I keep sinning? You ever ask that question? Why do I keep struggling with what I'm struggling with? How come I keep struggling with the same struggles? Have you ever realized that it's not like the devil adds new temptations usually to us? Usually it's not like you don't just out of nowhere be like, man, I've lived, I've been, I've been here for 40 years and out of nowhere got a gambling addiction. No, like those things don't just, usually, usually if you struggled with it, you just keep struggling with it. And it's like, if you've, if you've had an anger issue, it's like, man, it is always trying to overcome this anger issue. If you've had a lust issue, it's like, it's, I got to overcome this. Issue. If I have the, like, it's not like the devil just throws a new one at you out of the blue. It's not like you, you just like go, you're easy and out of nowhere you're at, you're at the gas station like just jacking Skittles bags. Like where'd this, where'd, where'd this stealing come from? I out, just out of nowhere just jacking M&Ms. No, like it doesn't sneak up on us. And so I think many of us have, have thought that question. How come I keep struggling with these sins? How come I can't forgive? How come I can't get over this addiction? And I want to talk about that today. In fact, Paul even agrees with you. Paul feels your pain. In Romans 7, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes a lot of the New Testament, if you're new. And uh, one of the things he says in one of the books in Romans, Romans 7, verse 15, is uh, he says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Y'all ever felt that way before? What I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, for some reason, I keep on doing it. How come I keep doing what I don't want to do and not doing what I want to do? How come I keep sinning if I don't want to? I don't want to be this angry person. I don't want to be this bitter person. I don't want this addiction. I don't want this pain. I don't want this abuse. I don't, I don't want it. How come I can't get over it, get through it? How come I can't change? How come I keep struggling with the same struggles? I want to talk about that for a few moments today. It's a tree issue. It's a tree issue. Do you know that there was two trees in the garden? Well, there's more than two, but there was two famous ones. But most of us only know about the one. Turn me to Genesis 2, verse 9. Genesis 2, verse 9. Sin is a tree issue. Genesis 2, verse 9. They're going to put it up. We're going to read it together. Genesis 2, 9. Put your glasses on. Make sure you get a magnifying glass. Make sure you can read this. Real bold print. I wanted to make sure you got it. Out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasantest to the sight and good for food. 
the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you know that there was two trees? There was a tree of life and there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's the tree that Eve and Adam eat from. Bring the curse, bring sin, bring all this heartbreak, bring all this into the world. But there was a separate tree that they could have lived from, the tree of life tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Since the beginning of time, most of us, in fact, may I say, may I be as bold to say, probably all of us struggle with living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean? To say? It means that we want to live lives that we know what's good and we know what's bad and we judge everyone according. Am I good enough? Am I bad enough? And in that, in that thinking, sin grows. In that thinking, sin rules. In that thinking, sin takes power over your life because if you try to live a life good enough, you'll always make a mistake along the way. If your focus in life is, am I holy enough? Am I, because of my own works, because of what I've done, because I've done enough works, I'm better than them. Or because I know this good and bad and I've made some mistakes, I'm horrible and I'm worthless. And you beat, if you're living from the tree of good and evil, sin will always rule. But if you flip the tree and if you start living your life from the correct tree, from the other tree, from the tree of life, all of a sudden your life isn't focused on works, it's focus on life and relationship. And too many of us want to live from the works tree because we want to earn it. We want to be good enough. We want to be, we're, we're better than that. You, hey, don't you know how much I've read? Don't you know how much I've given? Don't you know how I've served all the time? And you start to add up all the Christian things that you've done and you want to be better than some. The problem is you'll always be worse than others. And if the devil can convince you to live a life from this tree, every time you make a mistake, he'll never miss the moment to condemn you. He'll never miss the moment to beat you up with what you've done wrong. You're not ever good enough. Don't you know where you've come from? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know your failures? Don't you know your mistakes? Don't you know your addictions? You'll never be good enough. You are abused. You're overlooked. You're belittled. You're not enough. You'll never be used. God can't use a person like you because you're trying to live from the knowledge of good and evil, not from the tree of life. Maybe a better way of saying it is, what's the aim? What's your goal in life? Is, are you living and are you shooting at the target that says, I'm good enough? Or are you trying to shoot at the target that says life? What's your goal in life? Many of us are attempting to live from the wrong tree. In Matthew 7, 21, it's a fascinating scripture to me. Jesus is talking about the end of the age and he says he'll be judging us. And he says he'll put some people in front of him, divide them into two groups and to one group he'll say, depart from me, depart from my presence, from eternity with me, depart from me for I never knew you. I didn't know you. I don't know who you are. And they'll reply, but but Jesus, we, we did works in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did signs and wonders in your name. We did all this good stuff. And to say, yeah, 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 I get that you did a lot of good. I don't know if Jesus is going to air quotes us. I'm not sure, but I feel like he should, you know, all the good stuff you've done. But I didn't know you. I don't know who you are. I don't, who are you? You see, because if we live from the wrong tree, we'll value the wrong things. And we'll be that group standing before Jesus at the end of our life saying, Jesus, look at everything I did for you. And he'll say, who, 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 are, who are you? Who, who are you? I, I don't know your name. I, I don't know your likes. I don't know your passions. I don't know your fears. 
I don't know your, I don't know the things that you had to get over. I don't know the things we worked through together. I don't know what we did together. I don't, I don't know you, but I cast out demons in your name. Yeah, but I didn't, I don't, I didn't see you in a quiet place. I didn't hear you when you were hurting. I didn't, I didn't know you. I don't know. I don't know who you are. Depart from me. I don't know you. Also, what scares me is the idea that their works were casting out demons, doing signs, wonders, and miracles. That seems like a lot of good stuff. Dare I say more than most of us. Dare I say more than most of us. And even those people, Jesus is like, yeah, they're going to be sent out of heaven, hurting, lost for eternity. Not because of what they did, but because of who they didn't know because they were living from the wrong tree. So they were focused on sin and they were focused on good works and they were focused on what they did, but they lost sight of who it was for. They lost sight of the relationship. And many of us today would unfortunately find ourselves in that same group, judging ourselves and judging others based off of our works and missing the relationship. But Jesus said, I don't know them. Does Jesus know you? Do you know Jesus? Or are you living this Christian life full of works, full of attempts, full of trying, but you just keep failing? See, when you you flip it and you say, listen, no longer am I going to try to be a Christian and just not sin. But I'm actually going to be a Christian because I simply love Jesus. Then the not sinning just becomes a part of your life because it just drifts away because your pursuit of Jesus is so natural. It's so passionate. It's so life-giving. Like, I just want to find Jesus and follow Jesus and be like Jesus. And in the process, I'm like, wait a minute, that, that addiction fell off. That judgment fell off. That bitterness just kind of went away. Because no longer is the not being bitter the focus, it's where's Jesus? It's the relationship with Jesus that grows. And as a byproduct, the fruit in your life changes. But too many of us are so focused on the fruit that we've never spent any time in the roots. And we keep trying to work and work and work and work and work and work and work work harder and do more and put on a good show. Look at all my filters. Look at my Instagram posts. And Jesus is like, I mean, I see it. And I know a lot of other people liked that post, but who are you? Who are you? Without a filter, without a show. What? without a thousand photos to get the one that works for everyone to see. You know what I'm talking about. Come on, somebody. Come on, parents. Who are you? And too many of us are attempting a false relationship with Jesus based off of our earning it, our deserving it, our working for it, as opposed to our pursuit after Jesus. In Matthew 3, 17, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Jesus gets baptized, beginning of his ministry. He hadn't done anything yet. Hadn't prayed for anyone, hadn't cast out any demons, hadn't raised him from the dead, hadn't opened a blind eye, hadn't opened a deaf ear, hadn't removed leprosy, hadn't done nothing. He comes out of the water. The heavens, it says the heavens open and everyone could hear an audible voice from the heavens. And it was God saying, this is my son and whom I'm well pleased. This is my son, and I'm proud of him. I remember when my son was born. Comes out all sticky and slimy and, you know what I'm talking about? No, let's be honest. It is what it is. It wasn't like a Lion King moment. It was a... I'm in the hospital. I'm like, ah. But I was like, I get him, and I'm like, I'm so proud of you, boy. What had he done? He had breathed and cried. He had done nothing for me yet. So proud of you, bud. Many of you don't realize that it's not in your works 
that God's proud of you. It's in your sonship. It's in being a daughter of his. And when you realize that being a son and a daughter of his, before you do anything, be, before Jesus opened a blind eye, before he fed 5,000, before he raised the dead, before he went to the cross, Jesus, God says, that is my son and I'm so proud of him. But he had done nothing. And God's looking at you. He says, regardless of your works, regardless of the good and the bad, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. But what if I fail too much? He's still proud of you because you're a son. You're his daughter. But what if I mess up? He's proud of you. But what if I sin? He's, he's still proud of you. He still loves you. Too many of us need to learn, need to accept, need to realize that this, this Christian life is a pursuit after Jesus in a relationship with him, not a works mentality. We have to earn it or deserve it and do enough right and not do, enough, not, not do too much bad. No, he's proud of you and he loves you. He's for you. Many of us are living from the wrong tree. And the longer we live from the wrong tree, the harder this thing gets. Trying to be a Christian, trying to follow Jesus, trying to read your Bible enough, study enough, be kind enough, forgive enough, not have de unhealthy desires and addictions. And not, trying to do all the right things without a relationship is such a burden. It's hard. It'll wear you out. It'll beat you up. But if you say, no, I want to pursue Jesus. I want to love Jesus. I want to be about what Jesus is about. All of a sudden, it's life-giving, and it's refreshing, and it's rewarding, and it's filling. And you'll look back and realize, wow, like I no longer need what I thought I needed. I no longer act the way I act. I no longer have that anger issue. Why? Because I'm no longer focused on the fruit. I've moved my attention to the roots, to the healthy relationship, and that healthy relationship started producing in my life the fruit that I always wanted. Not only is it a tree issue, it's a belief issue. Turn with me to John 14, verse 12. It's not just a tree issue, it's a belief issue. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these will he do. Now catch this. First off, this, this verse doesn't work if you're coming at it from the wrong tree. The, like this verse, this verse has gotten more Christians tied up in a knot if they're coming at that verse from the good or the bad tree. Because all you see is works, 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 works. I just got to do works. I got to do works. I got greater works. Like good luck doing greater works than Jesus with no relationship with Jesus. Let me know how that works. But if you come to Jesus from the tree of life, from a relationship that says, I know you. Then it says, those that believe, greater works will follow. Jesus knows that what you believe produces how you act. Your beliefs are creating the works in your life. Your beliefs are creating actions in your life. And let me say it this way. What you do is the fruit of what you believe. I believe in gravity. And because I believe in it, I respect it. I don't just jump off of this stage because I know that gravity is true. And because I actually believe it, I act according. I don't jump off of buildings. I don't jump off of high, I don't, I'm not up on a skyscraper just like, I don't think gravity is real right now. Whoop. No, no, no. That belief creates action or a lack of action because of the belief in it. Many Christians claim they believe things about Jesus, but have zero actions to prove it. The Bible says faith without works is dead. What is it trying to say? It's trying to say, if you claim to have a belief, but follow it with no actions, it's not a real belief. Because if I started jumping off of stuff, then it would say, I don't think he gets the whole gravity idea. 
But because I believe in gravity, it defines my actions towards it. Sin is connected to your beliefs. Let me say it this way. Every sin is a broken belief in God. Every time you sin, it exposes an area in your life that has a broken belief in God. I'll prove it. You guys, uh, there's like a group federal way that Mill Creek doesn't believe me. Just a second, let me prove it. <laughs> Mill Creek's like, I don't think he's telling the truth right now. <laughs> Romans 14, 23. I'm going to read it from my notes because they're making it small up there. Can you see it? I'm kidding. Romans 14, 23 says, anything that is not done in, can you read it? In faith, anything that's not done in faith is, is sin. Well, that seems extreme. What is that? Any, what is faith? Faith is your beliefs, your beliefs in God. Anything that's not done in faith, Anything that I do in my life that does not include God or believe in God is sin to God. Woo, y'all got to get this today. I love this idea. I love this truth that Jesus is trying to get us today to get church because that means that I need to bring my beliefs into my marriage. And if I don't, then it's of sin. And I need to bring the belief that I have in God into my parenting or I'm bringing sin to that area. I need to bring God into my business. I need to bring him to my schooling. I need to bring God catches into the conversations that I have with the barista. And if I don't bring my beliefs of God into all I do, then what I'm doing dabbles in sin. Too many of us today have said or think, and we, and you know, you know, I don't actually think that. No, your beliefs prove it because your actions show it. We think that God is limited to Sunday mornings and some devotional time during the week, but then we leave our spiritual life there. No, no, no. God, God is about spiritual life. No, no, no. God is about all of your life. And once we get that truth, then we can start seeing freedom in our life from the sins in our life. That anything that's not done in faith is sin. So let's get back to this. Every, every sin exposes a broken belief in God. So, if you cut corners on your taxes, claim your kid is younger than they are to get a cheaper meal or a cheaper movie ticket, and don't act like no one else have ever done that. Anytime you cut corners to save some money, what you're really saying is, I don't believe that God is a provider, so I'm going to have to help him in this process. So I'm going to sin as I steal because I don't think he could fulfill everything he says he could fulfill. Oh, I got real quiet up in here. When, when you have a, a lust issue in your marriage, Pornography addiction in your marriage? What is that saying? It's saying, I don't believe that my marriage of God can fulfill my desires and my needs, so I'll assist God in fulfilling the desires I think I have. Because it's highlighting that you don't believe that God can provide. You don't believe that God can meet all your needs. You don't believe that God can show up and show off in your life or in your marriage or in your parenting or in your workplace. You just somehow don't believe that God is enough, so I'll help him on the side. I'll save some on my own. I'll cheat on my own. I'll steal on my own. I don't believe that God is a provider, so i got to find a way to provide for myself. Every time we sin, it exposes a broken belief we have in God. When you can't forgive, it says, I don't think God is enough, so I gotta hold on to this unforgiveness. I don't think that the Bible says vengeance is the Lord's. I don't think he's gonna do enough, so I wanna get just myself. I can't let it go until they suffer because I can't trust God in this moment. I'm angry and I just don't feel like God can help me through this moment. So I got to force, I got to, I got to, I got to make it happen on my own. 
I can't trust God in this moment. So I got to control the situation. I got to control the person. In my anger, I'm going to manipulate what I want, how I want. Oh, y'all quiet like no one ever does any of this. And every time you sin, you don't believe a truth of God. Sin's a belief issue. And too many of us have believed the lies of the devil and we're spending all of our time trying to swat the fruit off of our tree when the beliefs are in the roots. And if we want to change the fruit, we got to deal with the roots. So how do you do that? The next time you get angry, stop getting angry and getting angry and focus on the root that's producing the anger. The next time you have that lust issue, that temptation issue, why do you feel that? And what do you doubt in God that makes you feel you need that? Why are you lying? Do you not feel God can help you? So you're trying to lie to get what you think you deserve. Why is it that you feel the need to sin in that moment? What is it about your beliefs in God that you don't trust him with? Because everything that's not in faith is sin. But I love that now that means everything in my life should be of faith. Oh, come on, somebody. Y'all missed that. Everything in my life needs to be of faith. I need my marriage to have some faith in it. I need my parenting to have some faith in it. I need to have my conversations to have some faith in it because that brings God into everything that I do. And all of a sudden I'm in his will. I'm in his way. I've added God and his presence. to, And I'm not just limiting God to Sundays, to devotional time moments, to a few moments in the car where I'm listening to worship. No, no, I'm saying, God, you can have it all because I need you in all of it because I'm not trying to live in sin. It's a belief issue. It's a belief issue. He who believes, greater works will he do. The works follow those that believe. What do you believe? What are you doing? Because what you're doing is showing what you believe. And too many Christians don't truly believe their beliefs. You say that God's a provider, but you can't tithe. Just side note, tithing is 10%. And Malachi says that if you don't tithe, you're a thief. It doesn't say you're a giver, just in case you're wondering. Oh, I got real quiet, Coco. Third service wasn't ready for this volley. I don't know. Fedge away's like, we're, we're breaking up. We're breaking up. We lost the feed. I don't know where he went. Pastor gone. Like we just. Do you, do you trust God with your kids? Do you trust him with your marriage? With your, with what you think are your needs? Do you trust him with your future? Do you trust him with the economy? Do you trust God with politics? Do you trust his word? Because your actions are proving what you claim you believe. What do you believe? Do you believe God? Do you believe he'll heal you? Do you believe he's enough? Do you believe his, last week we were talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Said, do you believe God enough to get in the fire? Or does God always have to show up before? God's going to heal me. And then if he doesn't heal you soon enough, I'll, I'll stop believing. Do you believe? And will you always believe? I love, shout, I love last week they said, even if he doesn't show up, we will never worship. Why? Because our belief is so strong, it's who I am. It's not a momentary thing. It's not a phase. It's not like, no, no, no. I am someone that believes God. I'm a believer. You can't take my belief out of me. That's who I am. Do you believe God? Do you believe? I'm going to let that sit for a second. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 through 27, it's not just a tree issue. You got to get the tree right. 
You got to get them beliefs right, them roots in your life. Those roots are producing the fruit in your life. It's a belief issue. It's not a fruit issue. It's a belief issue. Lastly, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I will run with purpose in every step. I, I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Y'all catch this. Paul is telling us, he, he's saying, listen, those that run, they run to win. But we run for an eternal prize in heaven. For you to gain the eternal prize in heaven, catch this, catch this, you need to train your body. Wait, he says, for the eternal prize, I discipline my body. No, no, that doesn't make sense. Paul, I think you meant discipline your spirit. Right? Like, for an eternal prize in heaven, it's a spiritual issue, right? So discipline your spirit. No, no, no. Paul is saying, I discipline my body for a spiritual prize. Wow. Well, that doesn't make any sense in our world today. That's not very Christian. Isn't Christian all about spiritual things? What does my body have to do with this? Yeah. Well, why am I training my body to gain a spiritual prize? Because God wants all of you. And we believe the devil's lies that all, all he wants is my spirit. And I can act however I want, wherever I want, with whoever I want, Monday through Saturday, as long as I read my Bible a little bit and come to church on Sunday. But no, no, Paul says to gain the spiritual, to gain the heavenly prize, you train your body. So you got to change your tree. You got to uproot them beliefs and then you got to train your body. How? Why? What does that, what does that look like? I, I don't know about if you guys, but have you ever heard of like uh, those like, like rope courses, those obstacle courses, that team building things, you know, you rope in, you hold on to the course and you like go around trees or like some zip lining. I love a good zip line up in here. You know, like you clip in to zip from one tree. I'm, Hawaii's got a couple big ones. You know what I'm talking about. And when you do it, they say like they clip on the rope courses. You're like double clipped in, so you have like the harness that always looks awesome on everyone. No one's ever looked bad in a, in a harness. You know what I'm talking about? It's a good staff day when you're with all your coworkers. You're like, do I look awesome up here? Like, you look great. Keep going. Get it, champ. <laughs> it's like a humility moment, you know, and a team building moment. You're in the rope course. And they say, they say, hey, listen, you're perfectly safe. You're locked in. You can't fall. And yet, when you start, what happens? Heart starts to race. You start to sweat. You're nervous. Like your palms are sweaty. Your heart's racing. You're, like your, your muscles are tense. You're like, oh, don't fall, don't fall. But you can't fall. You're roped in. So why is your body fearful even though, practically speaking, you're safe? Because your body doesn't believe what's true. And so how many times would you have to do that rope course until your body actually believed what was true? Are y'all getting this? Like, Too many Christians today have been unwilling to train to the level where their bodies actually believed their beliefs. I just can't give because I don't believe it. I can't serve because I don't have enough time. I can't forgive because... And you actually have to train to the point where you finally start to believe your beliefs. You're safe. You're safe. You're safe. No, I'm not, I'm not, you're safe. I don't know. You're safe. You're safe. This father loves you. This father's not abusive. This father won't throw you away. This father won't over. No, God in heaven, he's, he's for you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. No, no. I don't know. I had a bad... How, so you got to train in your beliefs. you got to forgive and then forgive and then forgive 
and then forgive and then keep training yourself to forgive and forgive and forgive until it becomes so natural that you're just like Jesus. Like, wow, I just, I just naturally forgive. I've already forgiven you. But it didn't start easy. You had to train there. Training, training is done to produce power where it's needed. Training will always produce power. If I, if I can't run a marathon today, but if I trained for one, I could run one in the future. So training produces in me the ability to do what I couldn't do today. Many Christians haven't trained today in their life. They're baby Christians. They're infant Christians. They've been attending church for 30 years, but they're still babies. Because there's been no training so they could do nothing more today than they could have 30 years ago. We train to create power to do tomorrow what God's called us to do. So to overcome sin, to overcome the sin of unforgiveness, the sin of bitterness, the sin of addictions, you got to keep training and following after Jesus today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And you have to keep fighting to follow Jesus because as Paul said, I train my body today to win the race he called me to win so that when I walk into heaven, I'll get the prize he's called me to get. i got to train my body today. i got to train and train. I can't just keep giving up and go, oh, God will take care of me. Train. Work hard. But too many of us, just think, the Lord's will be done. The Lord's will. What, like, turn southern or something? I'm not sure. It's just like a real, you know, God. What? Like, if, if God wanted you to run a marathon, he would expect you to train for it. Yeah. Not just say, do it tomorrow. There's a training, and in your training, you gain power. I'm going to train to forgive, train to forgive, train to forgive. I'm going to train to let it go. I'm, just, I'm not getting upset. I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to get upset. I'm just going to let it go. I'm not gonna... How much training would you have to do driving in the slow lane to get that spirit of peace on your life? Get that rush up. Patience is a virtue. Come on, somebody. I bet some of you have to drive in the slow lane for four months. Until you're like... Oh. Okay, I've been training every day. It takes training. Some of y'all that struggle with gossip, be quiet. I'm not joking. That wasn't a joke. I mean it. Be quiet. Train yourself. Be quiet. Oh, but you... Shh, shh, shh. 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 Oh, but shh. Stop. Stop. Shut up. But did you? No. Am I going to do something? Are you going to do something? Then both of us should shut up. Here's why you're training. Because you, your, your physical body wants to say something and you need to say, I'm going to be quiet for 24 hours because I can take control of myself and train myself to be the, spirit of the spiritual person God's called me to be. Oh, come on, somebody. Y'all. Some of you men that struggle with lust and you want to just take whatever your body wants, you need to fast for a day. You need to show your body that I'm done taking in whatever I want. I won't eat for a whole day to show my body that even though I desire something, I could cut everything off of my body. I don't get desires today. No physical desires coming into my body today for 24 hours. I'm s Why? Because you need to find a way to train your body to live out the beliefs you claim you believe. You need, to find the, you need to find the counterbalance training to get you to the place God's called you to go. And here's the best part. Here's the best part is the band can come on the stage. If it starts with the tree of life, and if it starts with you actually love Jesus, and, and you're for Jesus, and you want to follow after Jesus, then this training isn't hard because it's what you actually naturally will want to do. You'll want to follow Jesus. You'll want to be like Jesus. You're going to want to forgive, and you're going to want to give, and you're going to want to serve, and you're going to want to love, and you're going to want to be patient. You're going to want to walk in kindness. You're going to want these disciplines. You're going to want to fast and have silence and solitude in your life and have giving in your life. You're going to desire the training because it's producing in you ultimately what you want in your life. 
But too many of us are still focused on good and bad, right and wrong, and so it's too hard to overcome the sins in our life because we've started from the wrong points. But if we could shift our tree, and if we could stop living from sins, from right and wrong, good and bad, if we could shift our perspective to it's a relationship focus with Jesus. Jesus isn't focused on casting out demons and signs and wonders and miracles. He's focused on knowing you. I just want to know you. Who are you? And if you could realize that Jesus is proud of you and he's for you, that he loves you, then you'll naturally pursue him. And all of a sudden this training that Paul talks about, it becomes the joy of your life. It becomes the desire of your life because Jesus is the focus of your life. Sin is the fruit. And too many of us have been spending our whole life trying to swat the fruit off the tree, but we've never slowed down and said, wait, what are the roots that keep growing this fruit? What can I do today to change these roots, to grow in my life the fruits of the Spirit that God's called me to grow? Come on, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes today. Before we leave today, I want to give every single person in our rooms and watching online an opportunity to make their life right with Jesus. If you've never started a relationship with Jesus, this is your moment. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, this is your moment. Or maybe once in your life you follow Jesus, but you realize that your life has been much more focused on right and wrong, good and bad, and not a relationship with him, and you need to recommit your life to him today, this is for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed and those praying that can, if I could pray for you right now here in Mill Creek, there in Federal Way or online, wherever you're watching, to connect with Jesus and to start a relationship with Jesus, with no one looking around, if I could pray for you right now, would you just lift your hand in the air so I could see who we're praying for today? Lift your hand with boldness and say, this is, this is for me. You're talking to me right now. I need this relationship with Jesus. I need to start this. I need to start a relationship, not a works-minded thing, not a, a performance, but I need to start a relationship to pursue after Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hand. Who else in Mill Creek wants to say, before we leave, pray for me? Before we leave, pray for me. Come on, federal way, reach up. Reach up to heaven if I'm talking to you. If you need to start this relationship with Jesus, this is for you. Don't hold back. Don't be hesitant. Reach up to heaven right now. Online, I can't see you, but I know heaven can. Wherever you're watching from, would you lift up your hands to heaven if this is for you? If you need this prayer as a sign of surrender to Jesus, would you lift up your hands? Who else in the room saying, you're talking to me today? Before we leave, I need this prayer. That's awesome. You guys can put your hands back down. I'm gonna say a prayer. And if you raise your hand, if you need this prayer, make this your personal prayer to heaven today. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross and paying for my sins. In this moment, I ask you to come into my life, to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Jesus, in this moment, I ask you to come back. I recommit my life to you. From this moment forward, I will pursue you, pursue a relationship with you, be just like you. I'll follow after you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen.